And I am very honored to have the filmmakers, Bonnie Cohen and John Schenk. Please come and sit down. And I'm going to introduce Esta and also Esta Soler, who is the founder of Futures Without Violence, which is really one of the leading violence prevention groups in the country. So, yeah. Yes. Um, I'm going to ask just a few questions and then open it for the audience. Um, and I wanted to, is a tendency for us to want to rush into the, the issues that this film brings up so eloquently, but I want to take a moment to pause and just ask the two of you about the film itself, about making the film, um, what insights you want to give us into how you put it together um, and the kind of journey that it took you on. There's so much, um, in, including one thing that actually reminds me that there's several people in the audience tonight who um, were part of the team. Unless um, they left. Including our incredible editor, Don Bernier. I think you're back there. Um, Sarah Dosa, the producer, Robin Papp, associate producer. Um, oh, there they are. Hi, Don. Um, and uh, Don uh, especially deserves a lot of credit um, when it comes to the kind of the question of structure. We, we, um, long story that we'll get into later um, when we talk about um, Esther's work, but it was, it was a difficult film to figure out how to tell um, when we started thinking about the subject matter, and um, we worked with Don for, for a long time to come up with the, with the um, I guess what you might call the screenplay, the, you know, in the editing room, trying to figure out how we were going to put the film together, um, and that, a lot of that had to do with trying to take two characters who never knew each other but who had such hauntingly familiar stories and create really one story out of it. And um, that was our, that was kind of a, a major realization um, once we got into the editing that, that we would try to do that. And it felt like an unusual thing to try to do. And hopefully it works that, that you kind of feel when you start to hear Daisy's story in a way it, it sort of helps finish or embellish Audrey's story and, and, and bring that to completion. Yeah, it really does. You um, reacted when I said something about what kind of journey this film took you on. Well, I mean, I, I you know, John and I have two teenagers at home, and um, this, I think, you know, we've been making films together for almost 20 years, and this was by far the hardest film we've ever made. Uh, it was very personal. It was very hard. Uh, it was a lot to ask of these girls um, to retell their stories, and the boys, actually, for that matter. Um, but, you know, they were in it for the greater good. So, um, you know, we, we did a lot of soul searching about just how far we could push them and, um, uh, and, and trying to, and a lot of the story that we needed to tell had actually already happened. So that's also very difficult as a filmmaker trying to figure out how to talk in the past tense. And, um, as you see, you know, we used animation with Daisy, which is actually, I don't know uh, how obvious it is, but that is her original art that is brought to life on screen. So that was also really an amazing journey to go through with her and actually a big part of her healing. Yeah, that was really beautiful. I feel like I want to ask you, Esther, I mean, I just feel like, why are some boys and men so awful? And has that always been true? Is there something new going on historically? Okay, not all of them. He's good. He's good, and many are, and, but there are some, and some men who do these things and then cover them up and apologize for them, and so what, what do you know about that? Well, a couple of things. One is, I think, and I've said this to you before, Bonnie, um, we have a lot of work that we need to do, and one of the things that we often talk about is that sheriff should lose his job, um, and, yeah. right? I mean. Um, and when we finish the election in November, we'll work on figuring that out. But yeah. um, it, the, the other piece of the film is, that I think is so powerful, is Charlie. So I want to talk about Charlie first, because I think in Charlie there lies the solution. Um, here's Daisy's brother, 
who, when he saw early on these boys saying the wrong thing when he was teaching them about baseball, he wanted to teach them about life. And there are so many people out there that I think that is a moment that we need to explode and, um, and figure out how we engage men to teach boys healthy relationships. You know, how do we coach boys into men? We actually have a program that actually does do that, and we want to engage Charlie in actually doing that. Um, I, you know, I think that the fact that the boys who were the perpetrators of these crimes were also athletes, we really need to engage the coaches and to have real conversations with these guys. I think that we need to map for them, for the adolescent brain in development. We need to map for them what is acceptable behavior. And we need to hold them accountable to that. And if they want playing time, that's what needs to happen. So I don't want to be here indicting men. I want to be here inviting men into the conversation, into the solution, because it isn't just about changing the legal system, and I know there are lawyers in the house. We need to do that, and we need to do that, and we need to, obviously, we just had a case, the Stanford case, um, and what happened there, and we need a lot of work on the judicial system, but we also need to figure out how to prevent this, and it's not rocket science. It's about value. It's about holding people accountable. It's about stepping out when you see people doing the wrong thing. And that's what I think we need to do. We need to invite men and not indict them. I mean, most, I mean, you, you know the statistics, but, you know, most boys are good boys and most men are good men. I mean, the, the, I think statistics. And I'm sitting next to one of the, statistics, yes. Statistics prove That's well. exactly and right. And you know better than I that it's really a small, tiny percentage of boys and men that do this kind of stuff. The, the, pro the problem often is, at least through our kind of limited window into it, is that a lot of good boys are scared of the bad guys. And, um, and, and then when you get into the issue of kind of the juvenile aspect of, of some of these cases, there's the issue of juvenile crime and you can't hold a juvenile as um, culpable and accountable as, as you do an adult. And so you get into kind of the, the guilt of our society and culture of not, not dealing with it and teaching good enough lessons early enough. Um, but we've had, we've had experiences at, at screenings where um, actually me as kind of uh, the, the guy on the crew, um, uh, afterwards um, young men and, and boys will actually come up to me and, and tell me how, what a relief it is to see Charlie in the film because I think, I think oftentimes boys see maybe not behavior this bad going on, but, you know, kind of bullying and, and this kind of thing going on, and they're afraid to do anything about it. And they see Charlie speaking out about it, and it, it, it comes this kind of a sense of pride and relief, I think, to, to see young men doing that kind of thing and, and having real role models out there, which is a big part of your work at yeah, Futures. But, and I also think, um, and again, the, the, the Stanford case, it was, it was an older guy, but when the dad said it was just 20 minutes of action, I think we have a situation where we need to make sure that people are speaking out, that judges are making the right decisions, that athletic directors are holding their coaches accountable for a different kind of behavior on the field and off the field, and that schools are actually doing a whole lot more. And then the other piece that we need to figure out, which I know we want to do with you guys, um, is parents need to have these conversations with their kids. And they need to have them before they go to high school or even before they go to middle school. The problem is pretty pervasive. These girls are so brave, but it's too big. Um, and we need to have that hard conversation and it's not easy to talk to our kids about these issues. I think the film will give us that opportunity. And we personally want to say thank you for making this film. And we will make absolutely perfect use of this film to get that story out there. And for parents to have the conversation, they need to watch this film. It's really hard to do, but they need to do that. Yeah, I mean, we had some really interesting um, 
rough cut screenings of this with our own kids and their friends. Um, and that's where we got some of the best insight into what was working in the film. And um, what we discovered through those screenings was that the role of social media in the film and the way that it kind of plays this other character, another character in the film, um, really spoke to them. They really felt that they were being spoken to in a language that was real and current rather than sitting and hearing a lecture from an adult about you know, sexual behavior or respect for girls or whatever it is, drinking, social media. So uh, you know, we were excited by that because we have real life stories that have real life drama, they're real coming of age stories, and then they have this character of the social media that our kids and their friends really identify with. So we, we hold a lot of hope that um, this can be a real tipping point, a real moment for these conversations to start happening. And I think, you know, this is a very moving film. If people feel moved in the audience to take action, we do have um, literature out on the tables as you leave, but also I think you can, they can just Google your film, your organization, right? And they can see ways to get involved in getting this film out there. Well, and, and Futures Without Violence is working um, with us. They're developing both discussion guides for the film and educational curriculum that is gonna accompany the rollout. Um, Netflix hasn't done this before, but with this film for the first time, they're allowing a whole raft of community screenings around the country. So that's gonna be really great for um, starting these discussions happening. And when will that be happening? Uh, sometime this fall, early fall. Okay, that's great. I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions, if we can get people to take some mics down. I was just curious as to the civil suit that was filed. Is that a, an uncommon phenomenon of filing a civil suit in this kind of case when you know that uh, the courts wouldn't handle another kind of suit? Well, I think it's actually pretty common for um, families that feel like they don't get justice in the criminal courts um, in, in these kinds of cases to, to go after civil um, you know, go after civil cases and, and try to um, have some kind of lesson learned and get some kind of damages. Um, the, what, I don't know what, what the statistics are in that, but I do know something that happened to us which was really very unusual, which is that it's quite unusual for a documentary to be included in a civil settlement. And so we were, we were kind of busy editing the film and doing our last bit of filming um, about a year ago when and we had gotten to know the Pot family fairly well um, by this point and had been following um, kind of, we sort of had been wondering whether we were gonna cover the, some of the ins and outs of their civil case that was ongoing during the production of the film. And, and they called us one day and told us um, that they had settled their civil suit and that part of the settlement was that the boys had agreed to uh, participate in a documentary of their choice and um, it was just an absolute shocking moment for us because um, uh, we didn't, we never had a conversation with them about it. We didn't, we didn't have any idea that they were going, the family was going to ask for that as part of the settlement. And we actually, it sort of gave us pause for a moment because we thought, can we, can we be involved in a legal case? Can we allow the film to get dragged in and become part of the punishment of, of the way this family saw these boys being punished? Um, and having to cop to what they did and so forth and so on. And ultimately we decided, as you can see in the film, to include them and, and figure out a way to tell the audiences that, 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 that this was you know, part of the settlement agreement and that the way it came about hopefully is at least, part, at least partly evident in the film. And the reason we did so is that we really felt like it was important to get the perspective of the boys in the film and to see that, that these guys are, are kind of broken because of, of this thing that happened. Also, in some ways, to kind of see the lessons that they that have and have not learned from, from, from what has happened. We have your next question here, right in the middle. Do you still want to ask? <laughs> um, you already answered it, kind of, but I wanted to know what it was like talking to the boys, but you kind of already answered that. Well, I, I can elaborate a little more. Um, you know, 
It was the toughest day of production that we had. It was really hard to be there. The, the boys showed up with their parents. They'd been through a lot. They, you know, they, they had already been through a criminal case and then the civil case, and now here they were having to show up on camera to do this interview. So, um, you know, it was tough. And, you know, we, it, it's, it, we found ourselves in a very difficult position because we wanted to maintain journalistic ethic and, you know, have kind of a higher view, but it's, it, it's emotional, it's hard to do. Um, so it was, it was a really hard day. We had hoped, the reason we agreed to do it in the end was because we hoped we would get some kind of, you know, truth or idea from them about what went on that night, what, what they were thinking, some kind of crystallization of maybe you know, what boys think in those moments and it could shed some light and maybe educate. But, you know, as you can see, it was maybe too early, too close to when the crime actually happened. They, were, they weren't really rehabilitated yet. Uh, so it was hard for them, I think, to access any um, insight into what had happened yet. Maybe, hopefully, in the next couple of years that will come to be. We have your next question here in the back to your right. I have two questions. One is that um, Paige seemed to be missing from the second part of the film, and I wondered what happened to her. And the second one is, um, I, I get the, the um, idea about getting uh, athletic coaches in high schools to talk to their teams, but what do you do about university coaches and, and UC administrators. Well, I can take the first part and then you can take the second part. Uh, you know, there was a, the real difference between what happened with, Paige, with Paige's case and Daisy's case is that um, Paige's case was really um, solved and, and the boy came forward and admitted to what he had done and he was punished for it. Um, and so there was a lot, there was, there was a real closure that was actual and also psychological for Paige. She felt that um, she had gotten justice from the court system, that the boy had been punished, and she was really moving on with her life. Uh, and that, that never happened for Daisy. So there, there is, I don't know if you re recall, there's a moment in the film where uh, the mothers talk about that, how Paige had real guilt about the fact that she got justice in the court system versus Daisy. And uh, it actually got it, it got in the way of their friendship. It was a really tough period for the families. Uh, but that's basically what happens in the film. There's a real conclusion to Paige's story, and there isn't in Daisy's case. And it also speaks to some, uh, uh, some detail just about how difficult it was to make this film. I mean, of course, as, as a documentary filmmaker, we really try to leave no stone unturned. And of course, we tried to get in touch with the, uh, Daisy's perpetrator and just tell the story and ask him why um, we were supposed to ask him why forward and, and um, uh, admitting what he had done and make clear to the case. And we even offered to do it anonymously. And um, that's just a kind of one little detail of the million little uh, requests and battles that we fought to try to get people to go on screen and talk about just the subject matter. It's almost impossible to get people to talk about. So also there's just a little bit of an element of you do what you can as storytellers to get um, the, you know, the likely suspects into the film. And, I think we're just beginning to convince the coaches that they have a critical role to play. I, and what I, I again, you know, thank you for telling Charlie's story. Um, and we need to tell more of those stories. There are really wonderful coaches out there in America. Um, and unfortunately, there are still too many coaches and too many universities that don't hold uh, the institution accountable, but the Department of Education and the Civil Rights Division is holding a lot of universities and high schools accountable for these behaviors, and in doing so, and sitting down with these colleges and high school, they are now suggesting very clearly that these kinds of training programs need to be put in place. So the accountability is starting to happen. The other problem is um, people have not 
created enough program out there for the coaches to be engaged, and we're not celebrating the coaches that are actually doing it. And that's what we need to do. There are, there are those good guys, and we need to put them in other films, and maybe we can convince you that the next film that you do really does focus on that, which is how we even started these conversations many, many years ago, it seems. Um, but I do think the fact that the Department of Ed is now really investigating so many more high schools and even middle schools schools on sexual assault cases and then saying they need to change the entire culture of the school, including the athletic program, we're going to make some advances. But check in in about five years because right now it's very thin. We have your next question here, straight ahead. First of all, I'd like to thank both of you for uh, enlightening me. I, I was invited here by some friends and I'm a parent of two teenagers also, but I have been very moved by what I just saw. What is sadden, saddens me is the only reason I'm exposed to that is because I'm here today. Most people will never be exposed to this film, which is kind of sad. So my suggestion would be now kids all, when they learn to drive, have to take a six hour class in driver's education. Why can't they also take a lesson in this form where a lot more will get into trouble? What I saw the commonplace was there was alcohol involved in both of these instances, right? So completely what has happened is wrong, but I think everyone needs to be educated about alcohol and substance abuse and what happens when you get into situations where very bad things can happen. I recognize that those two boys are also broken, and I actually applaud that that sheriff as close-minded as he is, actually was able to get up on your film and say that. It actually shows us how much ignorance there is and how much we have to combat. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it, is, it is sad. And, um, you know, one thing that's, that's uh, you think about a lot when just kind of living with these stories for a long period of time, and I'm sure, Esther, you've lived long, long, <laughs> long I have much lived longer than you have, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> um, but you've lived longer with this Yeah, no, I understand. Well. Um, the one thing that, I, that uh, is kind of heartening about it, this subject matter is that it, you have to remind yourself of how far we've come as well. You know, I think that um, you know, our president and vice president are speaking openly about this issue now. Um, and you think about kind of what happened with um, uh, uh, LGBT rights in the last couple of years in this country and how quickly, uh, you know, what, what seems like um, takes a long time, can suddenly seem to happen really fast once actually social change does happen. When we were kids, Bonnie and I are, uh, you know, grew up in the, in the, Bonnie grew up in the, in the I, we both grew up in the 70s and 80s, and at that time the issue was, uh, you know, drunk driving and, and kind of the consciousness of that mothers against drunk driving brought to, um, to that issue. You know, it was unthinkable uh, that, that it became unthinkable that at risk and put other drivers at risk, at least socially unacceptable. And obviously people still do it, but it became socially unacceptable. And it's not crazy to think of a world where it becomes unacceptable to watch other people at a party take a girl upstairs when she's, when she, or certainly take pictures of it and share it. And so that was what we had to keep reminding ourselves and what Esther had to keep reminding us is that it's, you know, you tell these stories, you start the conversation, that's partly what documentaries do so well is they can reflect back on the, on the society and culture. And we hope actually, contrary to what you say, that a lot of people can see this film and will see this film. Um, I mean, the reason, by, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, the reason we chose Netflix and they chose us is because for exactly this reason. I mean, this is how teenagers consume media now. So the great hope for this film is that all these teenagers will see this movie. I mean, either because they're assigned it at school or because they happen upon it and it looks interesting or they hear about it from their friends. I mean, we have a lot of hope that this, the word of this film is gonna get out. There's now a platform to do exactly that, which is a great advantage. Good, I think I'm getting the message that we're gonna have to wrap up, but it isn't over. Please, everybody, um, you know the names, Futures Without Violence, Audrey and Daisy, you can find them online and you can help them get this film out all over this country. Thank you for joining us tonight. <laughs>